Today is the Feast of Christ the King, which is the last Sunday after Pentecost before the new liturgical year starts. So you don't have to wait for 2021 for there to be a new year. The new liturgical year starts in Advent, and let's hope it's a better liturgical year than we've had in so many ways. We have been reading the last few weeks in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, and we finished, and I'm going to stop doing that right now. Sorry about that. We're going to finish that chapter out today, and if you're following along in a Bible, sometimes they'll put these headings in that are not from the, the ancient texts. But the one today says the judgment of the nations. What? I'm. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, there's a reflection. There's a shadow up here. I've, I've heard about that all week. Okay. We're going to read now words that, again, are uncomfortable to preach. They're uncomfortable to hear because we are not used to Jesus talking in such judgmental terms, not to the world, but to the church, to the disciples, to the holy people, to the Jews of the time. This is his word for us here today. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, I'm asking for a confession this morning. How many of you have your Christmas decorations up yet? I've seen some folks online. They've got, they've got the tree up. They've got the music playing, they're baking cookies because they're so tired of the way things have been. They want that Christmas feeling. How many of you want to sing Christmas carols during Advent because you've waited all year? And then I'm going to make you wait until Christmas and then everybody starts writing me hate mail. Everybody starts showing up at the office door with torches and pitchforks saying, when are we going to sing Christmas music, woman? It's Christmas time. No, it's Advent, which is too special to miss. I'm going to give you a little Christmas carol this morning. How's that? I have to do a cough drop because I'm not, I don't have much voice these days. And it's, trust me, I'm not sick. Now, how many of you admit to watching the Hallmark Channel where it's been Christmas since July? Yes, there's, I, I thought this is so great. I walk in and I see Dottie Johansson here this morning. Who gave me socks last year that say, if you see this, don't bother me. I'm watching a Hallmark Christmas movie. Because I tend to pick on them a little bit. This is not a song that you're going to hear in a Hallmark Christmas music or on a special, probably. It's one of my favorite Christmas songs of all time. Sweet little Jesus boy, they made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child, they didn't know who you was. Didn't know you'd come to save us, Lord, to take our sins away. 
our eyes was blind, we could not see thee. We didn't know who you was. How many of you know that one? Got one hand up back there. It's a spiritual. And it tells the story of a world that received a savior that they did not recognize, just like the folks in the parable Jesus himself told today. Did it make you uncomfortable hearing that Jesus says, get away from me? Get away from me to those. Go to the outer darkness where the devil and his angels are. A hard word, like I said. But it's not just that it's hard to recognize the Savior sometimes in our midst, is it? It's hard to tell the sheep from the goats. I didn't get to see the picture Mike put up. I'm going to ask him to go back to the picture. Oh, there it is, right there. Is it a sheep or is it a goat? Raise your hand if you think it's a sheep. Raise your hand if you think it's a goat. Guess what? You're wrong. Oh, isn't that hard? Because we're talking about the ancient Near East, and the wild sheep and the wild goats were very hard to distinguish one from the other, depending on the breed. Now, some goats look very goat-like, don't they? They got that stubborn look on their face. They got the horns. They're ready. They got the little beard and everything. And some lambs just look so pretty. But let me tell you, have you ever been in a field full of sheep? They're as dumb as a rock. They're stubborn. They smell really bad, and they're not fluffy and white. They're covered with stuff, nasty stuff. I know this from my experience with sheep in West Virginia. I had a youth group there that made a Christmas movie, and we filmed part of it in a barn with cows, and then we looked for a field full of sheep. We were out in the field full of sheep, and they were not cooperative in the least bit. And if you turn your back on one of them, you know what it's going to do? It's going to butt you and knock you over. Very much like a goat. So here's Jesus telling a story, and we've read other stories that we've got to sort of unpack. Let's start with the Ezekiel passage. God is saying, like Alexa said, God had not been happy with the shepherds. Shepherd means pastor. Pastor means shepherd. Set over the sheep in ancient Israel. And so God is promising that God is going to come himself to save the people. He's going to lead them to pastures of plenty. He's going to lead them where the water is pure. And he is really upset with those who make the water muddy for those coming to drink after them. And he talks about justice. He talks about David. But if you don't know the history of the Old Testament, which a lot of folks don't, don't know the dates, this is well after David has died. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the one who has promised to sit on David's throne who for Christians we understand very clearly to be Jesus, our Messiah, the Lord, the good shepherd whose sheep know his voice and who follow him. But what does it say in this passage? That that shepherd will come and judge. God incarnate will come to earth to judge and separate the sheep and the goats, just like Jesus is talking about the fulfillment of that passage when he returns. Now, in order to fully understand Matthew's passage that we read this morning, the end of chapter 25 that we've spent three weeks on. Let me read you the first, the first two verses of chapter 26. And this is referring to the three stories we read the first week, the parable of the virgins, the five wise and the five foolish, foolish who let their lamps run out of oil. And then last week, the parable of the talents, the one who had returned on the investment that the master had given to his slave of this incredible sum of money was given more. The one who still received an incredible sum of money, even though it was just a fraction of what the others had received who returned nothing, was sent to the outer darkness. And then this morning, the one we just read. This is what comes next. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. It's amazing when we go to the lectionary, isn't it? The closer we get to the time of looking at Christ's birth, looking at the advent, his first coming and his second coming, reclaiming our hope in the future reign of God's Christ, we come closer and closer to the death of our Lord, which should get us to take this passage very seriously. Like I said, it's hard to preach, it's hard to live, it's hard to read because it calls us to account and accountability. 
If you've learned nothing else from this passage, the one thing I want you to learn is, say it with me, I am not that shepherd. I'm a shepherd. The word pastor means shepherd. I can't deny that. But we're talking about the good shepherd. We're talking about the coming Christ. I am not that shepherd. Repeat with me, I am not that shepherd. I am not that judge. Hard to remember, isn't it? We're not supposed to be the ones to distinguish the sheep from the goats, are we? That is way above my pay grade as a shepherd of the shepherd, as one who works for Christ, as one who is called to pastoral ministry. Not always easy to tell, is it? I want you to be very careful when it comes to judging anyone's eternal salvation because when we do that, we tend to judge ourselves. Like I said, it's not always easy to tell apart the sheep from the goats, is it? It's not always easy to understand the words even of Jesus himself. Some of his parables seem very straightforward and uplifting, and we look at ourselves and we feel really good. This is not one of those. Because what is he saying? But when we have seen him and we have avoided him or shunned him or ignored his needs, we have ignored him. A hard word from Jesus, our Savior. We have to remember always, he is speaking to the religious insiders. He's talking to us here. If he were just talking to the Gentiles of the time, or we would say the heathens of today's world, the non-Christians of today, we could go home feeling pretty well about ourselves, couldn't we? But not in this passage. That's not what it says. Now, in all that has happened in 2020, the one thing that didn't happen was the General Conference of the United Methodist Church meeting. I was wondering if God might be giving us a reprieve, trying to get us back into sync with each other. But I don't think that's going to happen because people are still digging in. I had someone tell me in the last couple years that God is absolutely clear in Scripture when it comes to homosexuality. And they could quote all five of the verses in Scripture that make that point. So I wasn't trying to play devil's advocate. I was trying to play more the angel's advocate. And I said, but what about immigration? Because I knew how the person felt about immigration. I said, that's kind of a biblical no-brainer. You shall welcome the alien. You shall welcome the sojourner. You shall not discriminate against them. You shall not treat them poorly. For once you were slaves in Egypt, once you were strangers, punctuated by I am the Lord your God. And the person looked at me and with all sincerity said, but that's not what that means. I said, that's not what that means, but the other is what it means? And they said, yes, absolutely. But what I'm going to ask you this morning is a tougher question than, we're not going to unpack all that this morning, okay? And I'm not going to tell you right or wrong, wherever you believe God is leading you to believe, but I'm going to ask you the question, what if this is the one? What if this is the passage that Jesus meant verbatim? No change, no, no editing. What if this is what he meant? that we will be judged by how we treat other people because how we treat others is the direct reflection, the very imprint of what we think of Christ our Savior. That scares me. That terrifies me. Because I can tell you, I don't always treat people as well as I should. Especially those who have no justice. Because that's, you can't read Matthew without looking at this passage from Ezekiel. They go hand in hand. Because the king, who is the shepherd, is going to come and going to execute justice for those who have been hurt. But how easy is it for us to overlook those who are most vulnerable in our society? Those who have the greatest need. Those who maybe don't seem deserving of our love or our care or our help or our dollars. What if Jesus means it when he says, what you have not done for the least of these, you have not done for me. It brings me up short every time I read those words. Oh, I'd like to think of myself as a sheep. I'd like to be one of those fluffy little ones that hops around and follows Jesus. Don't you love the pictures of Jesus, the good shepherd? He holds the staff and they all come to him like he's babe in the movie, the pig, you know, who just says, ladies, please line up, and they all follow. No. You know why? The shepherd has the stick, don't you? So he can whack them. Whack them hard. Whack them 
get them into line, just like I suggested that our ushers here, who are now what we call our bouncers, be armed with cattle prods to keep you all safe from each other. There have been so many times that I have felt the shepherd's rod pulling me out of trouble, but also getting me back on the right course in my life. And it is a, an accountability that we're held to. I'm not telling you what God is saying to you in Scripture. I'm not trying to tell you that, but I'm saying be very careful when it comes to judging others. Be very careful because you're inviting judgment into your own life. And maybe, just maybe, Jesus meant these words to be taken exactly as written. So we get there and we can say to him, Lord, we did see you because you opened the eyes of our hearts. The best line in the Ephesians passage, with the eyes of our heart enlightened, we might see Christ in the world. We might see Christ in each other. And I'm going to tell you this, you've got to look for Christ in yourself because if you start to look for him, you will see him because you will be thinking of him and you will be inviting him into your life so that your decisions are his decisions, so that your treatment of others will be the way he would have you treat others because you're seeing him in each other and in yourself. This is what these words are calling us to do, to a different kind of accountability. Not to judge others by their lack of piety, that's their personal behavior. We tend to do that, don't we? We tend to look down on people who are addicted or who are selling drugs to people who are addicted. We tend to look down on people who are poor and blame them for their own situation. In a lot of circumstances, we absolutely do. We will say, but I work hard for my money. Why should I be giving it to someone else? We look harshly on those who come into our country illegally because we think they should have done it the right way when we forget to look at what they might be fleeing in their homeland. We look at people very critically. And Jesus is saying, whatever you do to the least of one of these, that's what you think of me. Here's another verse to the song that I sang. You done told us how we is trying. Master, you done showed us how, even when you're dying. Just seem like we can't do right. Look how we treated you. But please forgive us, Lord. We didn't know it was you. Look upon each other kindly. Look upon each other with the eyes of Christ, with the eyes of your heart enlightened so that you may see the Christ in each other. Mother Teresa was asked often how she could continue to do the work that she did again and again with the poorest of the poor. She said, you look for the light of Christ in their eyes. If you look, I promise you will find the light of Christ in each other and in yourself. And then with the eyes of your heart wide open, you will see the world in a different way. You don't have to accept everyone's behavior. You don't have to like everyone's actions. But you are called in the name of your Savior to love them with all your heart. To show Christ that your heart belongs to him. This is a hard word from God. But it is a word that will change the world.